Well, the flight of the earls is the departure of the ruling lords of central and western Ulster, along with their relatives and followers. In September 1607, uh, from Rathmullen in Donegal. Um, the term flight was first used in English propaganda, actually, and it was trying to portray uh, the earls as um, fugitives who had been involved in a criminal conspiracy against the state, uh, and that they were somehow um, uh, escaping because uh, they had, um, they feared discovery. But Irish historians have more so tended to use the word flight to imply that uh, the Earls were fleeing uh, from political, cultural, religious, religious oppression, uh, which had been stepped up by the English state in the aftermath of the Battle of Conceal, and in particular, uh, O'Neill's submission at Mellifont. Uh, more generally, in Ireland, the flight of the Earls is regarded in romantic and tragic terms uh, as uh, the great lords fleeing uh, and this event being uh, the end of Gaelic Ulster. The earls were uh, Hugh O'Neill, Earl of Tyrone, and uh, Rory O'Donnell, Earl of Tyrconnell. He was the first Earl of Tyrconnell and been, had been created Earl of Tyrconnell in London in 1604. Uh, he had succeeded after the death of Red Hugh O'Donnell to the uh, um, in, in what now became the county of Donegal. Um, besides that, uh, O'Neill uh, brought three sons, uh, Hugh, Sean and Brian. Uh, he brought his wife, Catherine McGuinness, the Countess of Tyrone. She was regarded as a uh, rather reluctant uh, refugee, uh, um, like a famous incident when he ordered her to get back on her horse when they were uh, uh, moving across Ulster. Um, and then there's some of his chief officers, Henry Hovington, his foster brother and chief secretary, uh, other secretaries, um, Matthew Tully, uh, his chief manservant, Pedro Blanco, who survived the Spanish Armada in 1588, and Henry O'Hagan, the, the chief Gaelic uh, uh, officer in the Lordship. They fled with him. Uh, and then um, there was O'Donnell and uh, his two sons, uh, Rory O'Donnell and his two sons, and uh, Cuconet uh, Maguire, Lord of Fermanagh, who had hired uh, the ship that took them uh, out of Ireland. Uh, and besides that, there were, there were a lot of other followers making up uh, the 99. Uh, also amongst those followers is uh, Taig O'Kinon, uh, a Gaelic scholar, uh, and he wrote a famous account of the flight of the Earls, taking them uh, right to Italy. And that is an important historical account, but also an important work of Irish literature. Um, uh, also, it, it should be remembered who was, who was left behind. Uh, one of O'Neill's sons, Con O'Neill, who was being fostered out uh, somewhere north of Loch Ney, he couldn't be found and they left without him. He eventually uh, is taken under English control and is eventually moved to England, first to be educated at Eton College, but then when he becomes a political danger, he's moved and imprisoned in the Tower of London. A very unfortunate uh, character, uh, Con O'Neill. And then uh, there's Hugh O'Neill's brother, Cormac, his faithful ally during the war, 
uh, who had to fight as a proxy while O'Neill was pretending to be loyal. He is now left in the lurch. Uh, he wasn't informed about the flight. Uh, and um, in any reasonable circumstance, he should be given power of attorney over the estates of uh, the Tyrone Lordship because he was next in line, but he wasn't given that. Consequently, I, he's very shortly afterwards arrested by the state and he too is sent to the Tower of London. After the war, there had been a sort of lull when um, Hugh O'Neill and Rory O'Donnell depended on the support of their conqueror, as it were, um, Lord Deputy Mountjoy. He had supported them at court in London. But as his influence began to wane, uh, the situation started to move against them, particularly uh, with uh, Sir Arthur Chichester, the new Lord Deputy, uh, whose brother had been killed by O'Neill during the war, and, um, or at least by O'Neill's underlings in um, the McDonald's near Carrickfergus. And um, Chichester was being assisted by Sir John Davies, the, solicitor, the new Solicitor General of Ireland, who was doing all sorts of legal manoeuvres. So the situation after this is difficult. O'Neill's territories now have um, garrisons planted in strategic points, uh, which har are harassing him and O'Donnell. Uh, some important um, subjects of O'Neill and O'Donnell have been, have been given uh, independent control of their lands. Uh, this is particularly affecting O'Donnell uh, because Neil Garve O'Donnell in uh, 1912, Northwest Donegal and the O'Doherty's in Inishowen had been effectively given independence uh, from um, the ruling O'Donnell. And then there was the issue of fishing rights. The Ulster Lords had made great revenues from salmon fishing in particular, uh, from the rivers Ban, Foyle uh, and the Urn. And now they were subject to confiscation. Those revenues were being lost. Uh, the church was being taken over by uh, Protestant churchmen and Protestant bishops. And the bishops, the new Anglican bishops, were anxious to wrest control of church lands uh, from the Gaelic Lords, because the Gaelic Lords had effectively taken over what had been up to then Catholic church lands. Um, and besides all that, then after the war, they re-establish the uh, settlement at Monaghan, the freeholder settlement in Monaghan, and they're now planning a freeholder settlement in uh, Fermanagh and presumably Donegal and ultimately Tyrone itself. And so the promotion of the freeholders is really going to undermine these lordships. So in the first instance, the people immediately affected, uh, affected and the people who are anxious to take the boat out of the country to seek service with Spain are Cuconnet Maguire, Lord of Fermanagh, and Rory O'Donnell, who is uh, Earl of Tyrconnell. They're anxious to leave because they're in huge debt and being continuously harassed. So what leads Hugh O'Neill to join the flight himself was the situation which had developed over O'Kane, or O'Cachan. The O'Kanes uh, were in charge of what is now County Derry. And the O'Kane was crucial to the O'Neill Lordship. Uh, in fact, Hugh O'Neill claimed that his lands, uh, O'Kane's lands were actually part of Tyrone. And also, besides that, uh, the O'Kane played 
a big part in the ritual at Tullahogue, which made, uh, went into the ceremony of making the Great O'Neill at Tullahogue. So consequently, he had a huge importance in the revenues of Tyrone, but also in the ritual uh, control of the lordship and the inauguration of the ruling lord. So basically, Hugh O'Neill couldn't afford to lose control of Donal O'Kean. Now, one of the Anglican bishops, Bishop Montgomery, first of all encourages um, O'Kean to divorce O'Neill's daughter, uh, Rose O'Neill, to repudiate her, and then in turn to take a lawsuit uh, to gain independence from uh, the earldom of Tyrone. First of all, Hugh O'Neill resists that legally. He gets a sort of reprieve, and, but then they decide, the state decides that the case is to be decided in London, at court in London, where presumably King James himself is going to play some part in that. But Hugh O'Neill, in the late summer of 1607, receives news that if he goes to London, he will likely be arrested and uh, presumably uh, be imprisoned or, or, or put on some sort of show trial. And now this had happened at the end of Elizabeth's reign uh, with uh, the second Earl of Essex, uh, wh whom Hugh O'Neill had famously met at the Ford. Um, so he knew all about how uh, evidence was stirred up against uh, Essex. Uh, and indeed, there was the more recent case of the gunpowder plot. Now, of course, the gunpowder plot was a very real plot, but a huge amount of fabrication had gone on to entrap all these plotters. So, and there's a great deal of anti-Catholic hostility at this time in England, especially after the gunpowder plot. So it was a very dangerous time to go to London. And what was making it more dangerous was there was Christopher St. Lawrence of Hoth, who was making a whole lot of allegations about um, conspiracies between the Peel's men in Dublin, uh, who were, whose Catholicism was under real pressure uh, at this point, and the Ulster men, and indeed further afield with Spain and Rome, etc. So, um, Christopher St. Lawrence was churning out a whole lot of uh, allegations. Now, in fact, Chichester and Davies uh, were very suspect of the reliability of many of St. Lawrence's claims. But basically, uh, you can see the situation that if O'Neill went to London and some sort of trial or suspicion was drawn upon him, that these allegations of Christopher St. Lawrence would simply be used against him. Uh, and uh, he, he would be um, condemned. So consequently, at this point, even though he was just, a point, just at the point of arranging a very advantageous marriage uh, for his eldest son, Hugh, uh, with a, a Scottish lord, and a, that would have been a very interesting marriage alliance, um, he decides not to proceed with that marriage, but to join the flight with Maguire and O'Donnell, essentially because uh, once Maguire and O'Donnell left, he himself had no, um, he was first in line, basically. And if they left on the sudden, he would also be uh, condemned uh, as being involved in some nefarious way with them. So basically, at the end of the day, he had no choice. So on their way to Spain, uh, south of Galway Bay, uh, the, this refugee boat was hit by severe storms. Uh, the storms were so severe and the people on board were so desperate that uh, they put relics on a rope the relics containing part of the true cross, allegedly, on a rope back, 
which they trailed behind the boat to try and quell the waves. Now, they were seeking to go to, to, to Spain, presumably to Coruña in northern Spain, which was a place where a lot of the Irish refugees headed for. But um, the winds were such that uh, as they neared Spain, they were actually blown back across the Bay of Biscay towards Brittany. Uh, and thereafter, they have to head for the nearest land because um, they're really down on supplies, particularly supplies of water. Uh, and uh, they get close to the Channel Isles. They get very worried there because of English shipping and the Channel Islands are English. And they eventually head for the coast of Normandy uh, and uh, land at Kilbeuf, which is in the mouth of the River Seine. At Kilbeuf, um, they're put under a sort of um, arrest by the governor of the town because they don't have sufficient documentation. But uh, the Marshal of Normandy, the Duke of Montpensier, uh, realises who the refugees are and thereafter they're treated with great hospitality as guests. Well, if from, uh, from Normandy, uh, O'Neill sent one of his secretaries, Matthew Tully, to the French king, Henry IV. Um, and Tully managed to receive a license from the French king for the O'Neill and his party to travel uh, to Spanish Flanders, uh, what is now Belgium, uh, to, um, to do this, the French king actually had to deceive the English ambassador because the English ambassador wanted these guys arrested. Uh, and the reason why the French king did this was that um, obviously it risked diplomatic rupture with England, but one, he would have lost the respect of French Catholics had O'Neill and O'Donnell and their entourage been arrested and turned over to the English. Secondly, uh, Henry IV, King of France, greatly respected Hugh O'Neill as a soldier, describing him as the third soldier of the age. Of course, he himself described himself as the first soldier of the age. Uh, but he did do, Henry IV of France did do the English a good turn in sending O'Neill and O'Donnell to the Netherlands rather than letting them go south towards Spain because uh, that would have meant that the Spaniards would have had to have uh, kept the Irish refugees at court in Spain. Uh, so once they reach the Netherlands, they get big receptions in the towns they enter um, as uh, Catholic, uh, not only Catholic refugees, but Catholic heroes having fought such a, a brilliant war against the English in the 1590s. Um, they also receive receptions uh, from the Irish, newly established Irish colleges at Douai and Louvain, and they also meet up with um, Hen Henry O'Neill, uh, Hugh O'Neill's second son, who is in charge of the Irish regiment in Spanish service. Once again, that is one of the things the English fear about uh, the uh, O'Neill and O'Donnell being in Spanish territory because they've got the the Spaniards have got this Irish regiment of soldiers already in the Netherlands. Um, when, when they get to Brussels, they have a big um, receptions uh, and dinners hosted by the Archduke Albert and Archduchess Isabella, who are the Spanish governors of the Netherlands. O'Neill has put at the head of the table as an honored uh, guest and champion of Catholicism. And they also have a similar big dinner uh, which uh, the leader of the Spanish uh, forces in the Netherlands, uh, Ambrosio Spinola, puts on for them. Uh, so consequently, uh, they're uh, very uh, much uh, wined and dined when they arrive in the Spanish Netherlands as Catholic uh, stalwarts uh, and defenders of Christendom against these English heretics. Um, but 
very quickly diplomatic pressure from English ambassadors uh, uh, is put on the archducal authorities in, in the Netherlands and with the King of Spain in Madrid itself. And that diplomatic pressure basically thwarts any intention of letting the earls go, go to Spain. Like in um, November 1607, uh, they depart uh, and they're on their way to Spain, but orders are sent and they're brought back to the Netherlands and they have to spend uh, the winter in the Netherlands. The earls make this famous journey across Europe uh, through Lorraine, where they get another great reception from the Duke of Lorraine, to such an extent that uh, King James doesn't send a, um, a representative to the Duke's uh, funeral, because he dies soon afterwards. So annoyed is King James. They go through Protestant parts of Switzerland, which they're very worried about, but they see that Switzerland is a very ordered country and Catholics and Protestants can get on okay. They're, they're interested in Switzerland. They go across the Alps, uh, famously uh, lose um, part of their money uh, when a horse, a pack horse falls uh, into um, a ravine at the Devil's Pass. Um, they reach Milan, which is Spanish territory in Northern Italy. In um, Northern Italy, uh, in Milan, they're showing the, the defences of the city and the greatly fetid there because uh, the ruler there is Count of Fuentes, the second soldier in Europe, according to uh, Henry the, the IV of France. Uh, but it's there that they realize that they're not going to Spain. They make uh, impassioned pleas. Letters are, are written to Spain uh, about how uh, much um, endeavor the Irish put into fighting on Spain's behalf during the 1590s um, and how they'd uh, committed so much when they could have made peace with the English at certain points during the 1590s to fighting on against the English. And they also made claims that the Irish were originally descended from people who came from Spain, the Milesians. They made all of this case, but it fell on deaf ears. Because uh, at that point, they wanted to branch off and go to Genoa and take a boat for Spain, but that was not going to be allowed. Essentially, the Spaniards who had made peace with England in 1604 did not want to break that peace. Uh, and the Irish were casualties in that. Um, if they had um, allowed the Irish to come to court, the Irish would have uh, been taken up by the hawks in the Spanish government who would have favoured an early renewal of the war against uh, England. And uh, the Spanish regime at that point, which was too exhausted, still fighting the Protestants in the north of the Netherlands, they simply didn't want a renewal of the war against England. So consequently, instead, the um, Spanish encouraged the earls to head to Rome. So consequently, um, they, their next stop is Emilio Romagna uh, into papal territory. They're keeping well uh, out of the way of Venetian territory because the English have made diplomatic representations to the Venetians to arrest the earls. They reach the coast at Rimini. Uh, I don't think that they'd be doing much sea bathing in Rimini, but uh, thereafter they go on big pilgrimages to Assisi, the Franciscan uh, centre at Assisi, and also to Loreto. And now that they're heading for Rome, they're very much um, trying to impress their Catholic credentials. Um, uh, if they're going to have to spend any time in Rome, uh, they're obviously going to have to portray themselves. And they're already well known for their Catholicism, but that has to be even more pronounced. So they go to these great pilgrimage centers. And by that time, uh, 
there are, a reception is being prepared for them in Rome. Uh, Archbishop Peter Lombard, who had represented O'Neill as O'Neill's agent in Rome from 1600 onwards, uh, he arranged for their reception in uh, Rome. When they arrive in the outskirts of Rome, uh, the cardinals in Rome send out um, um, carriages uh, to the Porta del Popolo uh, to bring the earls into Rome. Uh, and they're giving a fantastic reception in Rome. Peter Lombard arranged for the entry of O'Neill into Rome. The, the cardinals sent carriages uh, out to the Porta del Popolo and the O'Neill and his entourage uh, were loaded in to the, uh, uh, th these carriages and Tygo Keenan describes this scene uh, that these carriages being drawn by great steeds in, into the city. Um, they're housed in the Salviati Palace, uh, or so-called palace. And soon after, they have an audience with Pope Paul V, uh, one of the great popes of the era. And um, they attend a lot of the Catholic ritual at that point in the year. Uh, they, they go to the pilgrimage churches and they see the relics. And all of this uh, is described in great detail by uh, Taigo Kinon. Most importantly, from history's point of view, uh, O'Neill and O'Donnell attend the canonization of Santa Francesco Romana. And as a result of that, uh, it has been recently identified by uh, Michal Macra uh, that O'Neill is in the painting of the canonization of Santa Francesco Romana, standing uh, beside the Spanish ambassador. Uh, so as a result, we have an actual portrait of O'Neill in a fresco on the walls of the Vatican. Um, so they attend a whole lot of ritual. They're the toast of the town. They're the talk of Italy indeed. There's news going all through Italy about the great reception that the Earls have had in, Italy, in, in Rome. And uh, they even annoy the ambassadors in the town because historically the principal ambassadors in Rome had the job of carrying the Pope's canopy at the Corpus Christi uh, celebrations. But in this instance, uh, because of the arrival of these famous Catholic refugees, the Earls had the right, uh, or the privilege rather, of, uh, of um, carrying the canopy uh, around for the Pope on Corpus Christi in that year. So, uh, in the first instance, uh, they were given a great reception in the early months of um, their, their time in Rome in, in late April and May 1608. As summer approached in, in 1608, things really went wrong uh, for the earls in Rome. In the first instance, uh, Rory O'Donnell and Hugh Barn of Dungannon, O'Neill's Ur, they went to um, Ostia on a outing, as it were. But of course, that's a famous region, famous for its malaria. And uh, basically, they and a number of their party caught malaria. Uh, Rory O'Donnell and then one of Rory's sons and then he lingered on a while Hugh Byrne of Dungannon died as well uh, so by ending up in Rome uh, basically three of them had died very quickly of disease 
they're buried in um, San Pedro Montorio. And that's why they have got more elaborate gra graves than O'Neill, because they, they died early. Uh, but because they'd ended up in Rome in such a, a area notorious for uh, bad health, um, you know, had they gone to Spain, into central Spain, uh, they, th that, those consequences would not have happened, almost certainly. Also as a result, uh, because O'Neill's portrait in, um, in the canonization of Santa Francesco Romana was yet to be painted. Rory O'Donnell, who, all, who was there as well, his portrait is not included. So he, he, he is not uh, sort of represented visually in history as a result. Um, so that was an awful business uh, for them. And it's very hard to see how they could have got over all that tragedy. Um, so as things went on then, uh, there were other difficulties emerged. Uh, the Spanish pension that they were supposed to be received is paid uh, uh, very slowly and very fitfully. And so they're on their uppers a lot. And indeed, uh, the so-called palace they have, uh, it, so, some of the descriptions is that they have hardly a stick of furniture in it. Uh, because basically the Pope gives them the palace and this, the Spaniards were supposed to pay for their upkeep. Uh, uh, but that was not taking place. So they're living in pretty impoverished conditions as, as the years go on. Also, O'Neill falls out increasingly with uh, Peter Lombard, the Archbishop of Armagh. Um, Lombard is anxious uh, to try to keep in with the Protestant authorities in Ireland as much as possible to stop the persecution of Catholics. Uh, and he also wants to keep control of church appointments, but the, the popes want to give many of those church appointments uh, into O'Neill's authority. And so O'Neill is anxious to appoint Gaelic Irishmen, whereas Peter Lombard, coming originally from Waterford, is anxious to appoint Anglo-Irish, Old Englishmen. So there's uh, anxiety and, um, and um, annoyance there between those two. Uh, also, the English are spying on uh, the Irish refugees in Rome. Uh, uh, Robert Lombard, uh, Peter Lombard's nephew, is acting as uh, a spy uh, for the English. And like maybe a whole lot of the things he's telling are, are just um, tales, but you know, there's, there's stories about O'Neill's drinking, the alleged infidelity of the Countess uh, of Tyrone. Uh, these are probably stories uh, to um, really suit um, the handlers of uh, Robert Lombard, who's become a spy essentially. Uh, for, for the English. Um, so things are, are, are very di difficult in, in Rome uh, for the Earls as the years go on. Um, of course, that is also uh, famously described uh, or represented in a play by um, Brian Freel, Making History. A lot of it is in fact incorrect because unfortunately, uh, like the upbringing of Hugh O'Neill, it, it was based on the a biography by Sean O'Fuelloin, uh, but it's nevertheless a very important play making history uh, uh, about Irish history and about the role of the church in Irish history and about nationalism. Um, but besides all this, despite all the pressures they were under, O'Neill never stops uh, being a politician. Like he's a politician to his fingertips. He wants to regain power. Uh, He's trying to get the Spaniards uh, uh, to assist him uh, diplomatically uh, in England or even militarily. Um, so what happens is that first of all, they, in the first days of the plantation, plant plantation isn't going well, and there's some thought of bringing O'Neill back. Uh, but 
In fact, it's probably Spain that puts a kibosh on that because they don't want to lose such a bargaining chip as O'Neill. Um, also, um, there is um, a military method uh, to regain control, a sponsor of revolt in Ulster. Uh, and there is such a, an attempt at revolt in, in, uh, in 1615, but most of that is discovered and there are further arrests and confiscations and people, more people are sent to the Tower of London. So basically, O'Neill never stops trying to make a comeback in Ulster to get rest restoration, either through Spanish diplomatic support or through some military action, uh, which of course would have probably involved the Irish regiment in the Netherlands. But that comeback is never possible. So he's a politician to the very end. Like this is somebody who spent their life trying to gain power, trying to hold on to power, and then trying to regain it. Uh, and like I would say, with the dying, his dying breath in Rome in 1616, he still got political ideas in his head. The consequences of a flight of the Earls are very extensive indeed. Uh, there are political uh, and cultural consequences in the, uh, the this is a severe lack, severe loss of leadership in Gaelic Ireland. At the time uh, when the, the, the 1613-1615 parliament is coming up, basically the English are more and more in control of parliament. The loss of such a group uh, of leaders is a disastrous on a national all-Ireland level. In the longer term, the loss of the leadership of Ulster is detrimental to political leadership in Ulster. Uh, and particularly because with the loss of secular leadership, that the church becomes a major factor in the leadership of the native Irish in Ulster. And you can say that that thing is only re um, uh, remedied in it, probably even in the 20th century, the late 20th century, where there is a renewed uh, native leadership in in Ulster. Um, and of course also had the flight of the Earls not taken place and O'Neill had tried to compromise and tried to go to London and perhaps tough it out somehow, uh, we might have seen that the plantations in Ulster would have been far less extensive, that there would be, would have been a, some sort of revolution in Gaelic land holding across central, southern and western Ulster. But the plantations would never have been as extensive in those areas. Uh, and the plantations would have been mainly confined uh, to, um, say, uh, parts of um, Antrim and Down and many parts of Derry, Donegal, the more coastal areas. Uh, the plantations definitely would have been less extensive as a result. And of course, then, uh, at certain points in history, in 1641 uh, and others, uh, the Gaelic Irish would have been able to play a bigger part. But of course, after the flight of the Earls, that is not possible. Their power and their influence and their capacity uh, is seriously um, uh, underrepresented. Represented. Their culture is in reverse. Uh, and also they're dependent on uh, people coming back from the continent like Owen Roe O'Neill and others. Uh, so uh, the flight of the Earls is, is a complete disaster for, for Gaelic Ireland and Irish history generally.